I'm going to talk about a new tool to understand human beings, unprecedented in human history, and I want to prove to you over the next 18 minutes that it might have revolutionary insights into who we are. And that tool is our collective Google searches. First, the old methods to understand human beings. So for the past 80 years, if you want to know what people are thinking or doing, you have one approach. You ask them, you conduct a survey. And there's a huge problem with surveys, which is that people lie to surveys. They don't tell the truth, they tell what makes them sound good. So for example, if you ask people, did you exercise your civic duty and vote in the election? We know, and I find this number staggering, more than 50% of people who didn't vote say that they voted in the election. Uh, my favorite example, a little R-rated, a uh, general social survey asked people about their sexual frequency. And they ask, uh, women say that they have sex on average once a week and use a condom 20% of the time. So you do the math and women are saying they, in heterosexual sex, they're using 1.1 billion condoms every year. You do the same question of men And they, about their sexual frequency, they're claiming 1.6 billion condoms are used in heterosexual sex. Does everyone see, by definition, those numbers have to be the same? So we actually can test who's telling the truth, men or women. Uh, Nielsen collects data on how many condoms are sold every year. Uh, so who's telling the truth, men or women? Uh, it turns out neither. Fewer than 600 million condoms are sold every year. So. Uh, I guess everybody's lying about sex now, men just more than women. But now we have a new way to understand people, and that is Google searches. And all the research I do uses anonymous and aggregate data, not any individual data. The key about Google is that people tell Google things that they might not tell anybody else. Things they might not tell friends, family members, doctors, surveys. It serves as kind of digital truth serum. And when you start analyzing this data, you get a different picture than we usually get of human beings. So for example, worldwide, there are more searches for porn than weather. Uh, even though if you ask people in a survey, fewer than 20% say that they watch porn, presumably everybody says they check the weather. Actually, in honor of uh, my trip to your wonderful country, Great Britain, uh, I did some research on the search trends here. And I found out that you guys, British, uh, you're one of the only country you actually search weather more than porn, so. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it's something to be proud of, ashamed of, but it's something. <laughs> and what can we learn from this digital truth serum, these Google searches? Well, one thing I've done a lot of research on, and this is a bit disturbing, is racism uh, in the United States. So if you ask people in a survey, are you racist? Pretty much nobody says yes. But you see on Google a disturbing number of searches, millions every year, uh, with racist material. So this map is the percent of Google searches that include the N-word. Not, they're not typing the N-word, yeah, it's the actual N-word. And most of these searches are for jokes mocking African Americans. And this map predicts a lot of behaviors. For example, places that make more of these racist searches were less likely to support Barack Obama, uh, the Democratic presidential candidate, compared to uh, other Democratic candidates, the black presidential candidate compared to other Democratic candidates. Uh, places that make racist, more racist searches are uh, pay black people less than they pay white people. So it predicts a lot of behaviors, and it might even explain a recent phenomenon in the United States, uh, namely Donald Trump. Uh, so if you remember, in the Republican primary, uh, Donald Trump said some very racially charged things, that Barack Obama might not have been born in the country, he didn't repudiate support from David Duke, uh, leader of the KKK, he retweeted false statistics, about how frequently African Americans commit crime. And all the pundits said, 
Trump is going to collapse. You just cannot say these things in the United States uh, and stay a, a serious presidential candidate. And instead of collapsing, he did better and better. And data scientists uh, wanted to see if these racist searches, this kind of secret racism that people aren't otherwise admitting, may be explaining part of that phenomenon. And they found that it was the single highest predictor of Trump in the Republican primary they could find, more than economic variables or demographics or polit policy positions. So no matter what people were saying, there clearly was a lot of secret racism uh, driving Trump's support. Uh, I've also done some research, and others have done some research, on using this to understand suicide. I feel so bad. I, I've been watching all these TED Talks, and each one is so inspiring and optimistic. And all my research is like, people are horrible, depressing, dark, uh, racism, suicide. But I, I actually do end on an inspirational note, so just be patient. Uh, <laughs> So it's been found that you can predict how many suicides there will be in an area based on Google searches. So when more people are searching, and these are really, really sad searches, obviously, how to commit suicide, uh, how to kill yourself, uh, it turns out there will be more suicides in that area. And we can also use this data to understand why people think of suicide. I've been doing research where I'm studying what do people search before they look for information on how to kill yourself, to kind of understand why people are suicidal. And I found that about 40% uh, of suicidal searchers, before they search for suicide, search for some health condition. So health seems to be the big reason, uh, more than financial problems or relationship problems. And what health problems? Well, the number one health condition that's likely to lead to a suicide search is not surprising at all. You didn't need Google to tell you this. It's depression. Kind of obvious. We've known for a while that depression is a big risk factor for suicide. But right near the top, and this we did not know, in health conditions that make people search for suicide, and I found this shocking, herpes, the STD. And we wouldn't know this because people might be embarrassed to admit to surveys that they have herpes, they're thinking of suicide, or herpes is making them commit suicide. And I think this says something really bad about our society, troubling about our society. Uh, the reason that herpes makes people feel suicidal is not because it's life-threatening, it's not. Not because the symptoms are so severe, they're not. It's because of the stigma, they feel ashamed, like they have a scarlet letter. And we might even be able to use this data to try to help people who are thinking of suicide by learning what they're looking for, what information might help them. So I did research. I tested when people search for herpes and also suicide, what else do they search for? And I found the top other search they made is celebrities with herpes. And you can imagine what they're looking for. They're looking for heroes or role models, right? They want someone to look, out, to, to look up to uh, so they feel better about the condition they have. So I googled celebrities with herpes to see what came up. And I found it's very, very different from what comes up when you do a similar search for another condition. If you look for celebrities with depression or celebrities with anxiety or even celebrities with irritable bowel syndrome, you will get many, many examples of celebrities who say that they have this condition to fight the stigma. But if you search celebrities with herpes, there are basically no major celebrities who say they have herpes. And what you instead get, and remember, some of the people making this search are young people who've just gotten a diagnosis they have herpes and are thinking of killing themselves. Instead of role models and heroes proudly announcing that they have this illness, you get people accused of having herpes, most of whom vehemently deny it. Not me, of course not. And my pet project now in life, uh, maybe my number one goal, is to convince some celebrities uh, to start admitting that they have herpes. Uh, it sounds silly, and yeah, I understand why people are giggling, but actually I really think, based on this data, it literally would save lives if celebrities did this, something, uh, and I hope that they do. All right, there's one final cheery topic I want to discuss, uh, and that's anti-Muslim attitudes. So it turns out on Google, some people, uh, not, a, not a huge number, but not a trivial number, 
make really, really nasty searches about Muslims. They search things like kill Muslims, I hate Muslims, Muslims must die. Not clear what they're hoping to get from Google, but they are enraged, so enraged that they just are typing these angry thoughts into Google. And this research I've done with Eben Soltas now at Oxford, you can see that when there are more anti-Muslim searches, there are also more hate crimes against Muslims. So if more people are searching, I hate Muslims, kill Muslims, more people are going to be attacking mosques or beating up Muslims, even in some cases killing Muslims. And I don't know how many people remember uh, the San Bernardino attack, December 2015, California. Two Muslim Americans shot and killed 14 people. And immediately after this attack, there was an explosion of anti-Muslim rage. Literally minutes after the media announced the names of the shooters, that their names were Muslim sounding, the number one search in California that included the word Muslims was kill Muslims. So really, really nasty searches had gone way up. And a few days later, Barack Obama realized that the country had a problem, that attitudes towards Muslims had gotten a little bit out of control. And he decided to give a speech to try to calm people down. And it got a lot of attention. It was on national TV. And the speech, I thought, uh, I'm a, full disclosure, pretty big Barack Obama fan. Uh, I thought it was a beautiful speech. Uh, he talked about it as the responsibility of all Americans of every faith to reject discrimination, how it's our responsibility uh, to not appeal to f fear, to, get, to appeal to freedom, how it's our responsibility to let everybody in this country uh, no matter their religious background. So it was a beautiful, beautiful speech, I thought, and all the serious people seemed to think the, the same. The New York Times said it was a great speech. The Boston Globe said it was a great speech. Newsweek said great speech. Great speech was the consensus after the speech. So we wanted to see what happened to anti-Muslim searches uh, during and after Obama's speech. You can actually break down Google searches uh, minute by minute. And we saw that these nasty searches about Muslims, they didn't drop, they didn't even say the same, they went way up. So there were more people searching uh, kill Muslims and I hate Muslims and no Syrian refugees and all these really nasty thoughts. So this is a pretty pessimistic, depressing conclusion uh, that a, spe a well-meaning speech by a well-meaning man uh, can actually backfire and make people even angrier. But there was something in the speech that might have a more optimistic conclusion. And that was at the end of the speech, Obama gave a different line, took a different path. He said that Muslim Americans are our friends and neighbors, they're our sports heroes, and they're the men and women who will die for our country. And you see, minute by minute, Google search data, seconds after Obama says this, a huge number of searches, Muslim athletes, Muslim soldiers. In fact, for the first time in many years, the top descriptor on Google of Muslim was not Muslim terrorists or Muslim extremists, it was Muslim athletes followed by Muslim soldiers, and these kept, kept the top spot for many days afterwards. And you see all around the internet, young men, uh, the people probably most at risk of having these nasty attitudes towards Muslims, were saying things like, Shaquille O'Neal's a Muslim, Muhammad Ali's a Muslim, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's a Muslim. They didn't know that their heroes uh, had been Muslim. So we published this, actually, uh, an article in the New York Times, and I think it's not crazy uh, when you write something in the New York Times that powerful people read it, perhaps someone in Obama's staff, because a, a few weeks later, Obama gave another speech, you know, a Baltimore mosque, again, to try to calm down anti-Muslim attitudes. And again, the speech got a lot of attention. Again, it was on national TV. But the content of this speech that Obama gave was noticeably different. So if you think of what we said uh, didn't work uh, in Obama's speech, it was using words like responsibility and should, lecturing people, telling them th what they should do. What maybe does work is subtly provoking their curiosity, give them new information. And you see in this speech, Obama completely stopped lecturing people. 
He didn't talk about what responsibility they had to treat Muslims right or the things that they should or must do. Instead, he really doubled down or tripled down on the curiosity strategy. So he said how Muslim Americans had helped build our nation, how a Muslim American built the skyscrapers of Chicago, how Muslim Americans are athletes and soldiers and teachers and uh, firefighters, and they've won Nobel Prizes and are, have created amazing businesses. So a totally different strategy. And I looked at the Google searches after this speech, and you see that many of the anti-Muslim searches actually dropped. So I'm not going to say from our two little studies that I've solved hatred in the world, uh, you know, that I've done what MLK Jr. and so many others could fail to do. Uh, but I do think that this study and some of these other studies show the power and potential of this data, that many areas we've just been clueless using the traditional data sources. But with Google searches, we can really turn uh, many, many questions into much more real sciences. Something even as chaotic as how to uh, calm an angry mob can be turned into a real science. Uh, so thank you very much.